This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger speaks with Professor James Sullivan, professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame and co-founder of the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities. Professor Sullivan and Roger discuss government policy towards poverty in America and the mistruths and misunderstandings surrounding poverty and being poor in America today. Dr. Jim Sullivan, welcome to the show. Uh, Great to be here, Roger. Thanks for having me. Of course. And now you are the professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame and co-founder and director of the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, known as LEO. You were also recently appointed to the U.S. Commission on Social Impact Partnerships, and you serve on the National Poverty Research Center Advisory Board. Take a second here and talk to us about what LEO is, its mission, and, and how it lines up with your area of research and expertise. Sure. Uh, So LEO is a research center housed here at Notre Dame in in the Department of Economics that partners with local nonprofit service providers to measure the impact of their anti-poverty efforts. And uh, really, it's motivated by this idea that, uh, you know, we spend uh, billions of dollars, $200 billion a year, uh, supporting local efforts by nonprofits to address the unique poverty challenges in various communities. Um, And yet we don't have a lot of evidence in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And so Leo partners with these nonprofit service providers to build that evidence with the idea that that evidence can inform policymakers who are making difficult decisions about how to allocate scarce resources, but also inform providers who are wondering, how best can I address this challenge in my community? They can turn to the evidence that shows that which interventions work best. And then even private benefaction and philanthropy will benefit knowing how to allocate their resources to support programs that work. Well, it seems like a a very useful thing to do. It should be evidence-based. Everybody, you would think, it's certainly in, in government, uh, wants to make sure we're we're using our our tax dollars most efficiently, and we also want to get at this critical issue of poverty. Uh, strikes me that th- the first step here is to understand uh, where the problem resides. You know, where exactly we do we find poverty in the United States? And I want to set you up with this one because you've written about this uh, and been interviewed on it. Uh, uh, one from 2021, New York Times stands out, uh, but certainly we've done a lot beyond that seems to be that we have one narrative in the country that the rate of poverty or the problem of poverty is increasing. And we have this huge kind of wealth gap in this country. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and, and, and that approach. And then there's another line of argument that says, actually, no, um, we as a country have been successful in reducing the amount of poverty in this country. Why don't we start with that, Jim, because you've uh, written on this and spoken eloquently on this subject. Tell us how to think about where we are as a country in combating poverty from the standpoint of, are we, in, are we, are we decreasing poverty or is it increasing in this country? Yeah, and uh, it's a complicated issue that I think it's, uh, th- there's a bit of confusion because oftentimes there's two questions that get uh, Uh, interchanged inappropriately. So one question is, um, who's poor and how many people are poor, right? And that's a a point in time question. And uh, and it's inherently subjective because we need to, in order to define who is poor and and how many are poor, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, we, we draw a poverty line and we say, families with resources that fall below this line are poor. And we can have all sorts of debates about where that that line should be. And a lot of the debate about the extent of poverty in the United States today is centered around where that line should be drawn. Uh, and uh, and inherently, there's an arbitrary part of that because because there's no science that tells you what you know people above this line are poor and below are not. But where a, a clearer question that we can actually say something objective about is: Have we made progress over time? Have the economic circumstances of those at the bottom of the distribution improved or gotten worse, stayed the same? And um, and there, uh, the answer is pretty clear that the economic circumstances have gotten better. And so what we see when we 
when we measure poverty appropriately over time, uh, we, what we see is that there's been dramatic declines in poverty. Um, we see it, uh, at, you know, as sharply, if not more so, for families with children uh, than other families. Um, and we see this over a long period of time. Now, to give you, to, to, to emphasize this point, if you look at the official poverty measure, uh, the poverty rate today is pretty close to where it was in the early 1970s. So that feeds into the story you mentioned about uh, we've made little progress in the United States. Uh, but if you address many of the well-documented uh, flaws where, of, of, around which there is consensus that there are flaws in the measures, uh, we see that poverty has declined sharply uh, on, on the order of a, a decline of uh, more than uh, 35 percent over the past uh, uh, four decades. So, and, so just give us a little bit more color on that. So it's there when you say it's declined 35 percent kind of what's the base what are we measuring against what does that actually mean 35 percent against what yeah actually can i restate that oh go is ahead that, go ahead because because i was saying that in percentage points point uh, percentage point terms it, it, uh, so the the actual decline in percentage terms is a decline of more than 75 percent and it would be a decline of roughly 40 percent in early 1970s to below 10 percent today uh, whereas the official poverty rate would say it was a, a little over 11 percent in the early 1970s, and it's about a little it's a little over 11 percent today, and so that so there's this the noticeable difference uh, for a number of reasons that are built into the the flaws in, in the study. Okay, so that, that that's a super interesting. That one approach looking at certain data, I guess um, you know uh, labor you know, bureau statistics versus you know kind of what 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 they're kind of using to calculate poverty, but one approach. Looking at one set of data, could say, "Hey, it's pretty much no difference from the 1970s." Another one would say, "Actually, it's declined significantly, as you just laid out." Part of that, I've seen you write on this, and uh, uh, Senator Phil Graham recently published a book with, some, with a couple other co-authors, also I think hitting on a similar set of points that really goes to whether or not we take into account uh, transfer payments. I mean, the, the not just the income of the poor, but also the income of the poor and the payments, transfer payments in terms of government, whether it's SNAP, uh, housing, other forms uh, of, of help uh, that government gives to those uh, you know, at the poverty line, below the poverty line. Uh, is that what you're getting at? Is there something else that explains this, this difference? No, there are, I mentioned broad consensus around the flaws in the official poverty measure. Um, perhaps the, the one that's most often emphasized is the point you just made, that uh, many of the uh, components of income that, uh, that particularly for disadvantaged families um, are not reflected in our poverty measure. In, in uh, 1964, we declared a war on poverty and we significantly expanded the social safety net in large part in ways that are not measured in our official poverty measure. So we have a metric to measure how well we're doing in fighting poverty that doesn't in include the key tools that we're using to fight. So let me give you an example. Um, we launched the uh, food stamp program now called, known as the SNAP program in the United States uh, as part of the war on poverty. That, that is, uh, you know, now upwards of a $60 billion program, and, uh, and yet it's not included in our measure of poverty because our measure of poverty measures cash income, and, and the SNAP program is an in-kind transfer because it's, it's a, a food, a voucher essentially to, to purchase food. Uh, we've also uh, invested a lot of our, our um, efforts to support the working poor through the earned income tax credit, right? Also a, a multi-billion dollar program that uh, that program is not included in our measure of poverty because we have a pre-tax income uh, measure of poverty. And so it's, um, you know, it's strange to have a, a tool for measuring poverty that, that doesn't include uh, the key efforts that we've used. The last one is poverty. quite interesting, Jim, because for pre-tax income is not included, I'm sorry, you, you, you don't, you don't, it's not post-tax, right? So yep. if it's only looking at pre-tax and it doesn't take into account their earned income tax credit for somebody who is working poor? Yeah. It also doesn't take account the amount of tax a wealthy person might pay in terms of their income. Of course, that 
uh, as well. So That's almost like it's uh, someone and, and your mission at Leo, of course, um, you're trying to get at policy solutions to deal you know, with the problems as they are and trying to get the best data, it would seem to be, and this probably goes to the heart of what, what you work on, is that some of the data that's coming out of government is actually not helpful into solving problems. Because if we're just looking at the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures poverty, it wouldn't take into account, as you've just noted, the transfer payments. And you might end up yeah. trying, for example, to provide food to uh, people in poverty where they actually get a food benefit uh, from the SNAP program. I mean, because I know that's a pretty kind of generalized example, but that would seem to be go where you're trying to take the work of Leo. Correct me if I'm wrong there or, or, or expand on that. Yeah, no. So the, you know, I, I think that the data the government provides and, and, and others that they could provide can be and are very helpful. It's it's how we're using it that 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 is uh, uh, maybe less helpful. Um, you know, I don't want to be too critical of Molly Orshansky, who who oftentimes is giving credit for designing the way we measure official poverty uh, in the United States. She did this uh, in the early 1960s at a time when most of the resources for low-income families was pre-tax money income. So it was kind of the right measure. It's just that it's changed over time in terms of how we redistribute uh, resources um, and our measure has not has not kept up. Um, and uh, but it's pretty straightforward to show that if you correct for these flaws in the official measure, that uh, that there's been dramatic improvement. And, and I think it's really important to emphasize that that, uh, you know, it's not just that my research that's showing that that's National Academy of Sciences research that did a report on on uh, po child poverty and it's uh, you know the uh, Council of Economic Advisors under Obama and under Trump who both you know both showed that there's been these these sharp reductions in poverty and yet you still see uh, people cite the official measure and claim that we haven't made progress. Well, and it's understandable people do cite it because it would be the obvious place to go. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. writing and others you point out that there's a supplemental information and so. Mm -hmm. My understanding is the supplemental L, you know, piece here in the Bureau of Labor Statistics would include uh, at least some or all of the transfer payments we were just discussing. Is that accurate? Yeah. So there have been uh, there are many other alternative measures of poverty. Uh, when you uh, adjust the official poverty measure to include uh, payments like SNAP payments and uh, housing subsidies and the earned income tax credit, uh, those programs that have expanded significantly over time, you do start to see that drop in in poverty, and uh, and other adjustments. Like so, one thing that in our work we've emphasized is that income. Uh, we we get our our income measure for poverty from surveys, and uh, income uh, much of income is missed, and so uh, you're going to get a more accurate picture of the well-being at the bottom if you look at, at how they spend, what, what uh, how much resources they actually spend to consume goods and services. Right, so consumption is a better uh, kind of piece, a data set in terms of understanding poverty as opposed to what people are self-reporting on, on income. Uh, let's just take a step out, step back here, Jim, because you know we, we got into this discussion about you know whether or not poverty is increasing in the United States or decreasing relative, let's say, the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And we got this discussion, okay, well, what's taking the count in terms of uh, answering that question, focusing on a few examples just now that are in these transfer payments or other types of benefits to, to address this prob problem. Could you state for us just generally how with, you know, looking at the data as you've organized it in your mm -hmm. mind and at Leo, characterize uh, the level of poverty in the country today? You know, where, 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 where is, you know, how do you explain uh, whether or not it's gone up or gone down? Now, what is it? You know, what, what is, what is the poverty rate? And explain what you mean when you talk about poverty rates. So we're going to get to this in a second with respect to how the OCD looks at the, the rate of poverty in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is a question that's really hard to answer because it goes back to a, a point I made earlier about in order to, to specify a poverty rate today, you need to specify a poverty line. And to do that, you need to make a decision, an inherently subjective decision about what constitutes or counts as being poor versus versus not poor. And we might differ on, on, on what that is. Another important point that I like to make is that our opinion about what the appropriate poverty line should be might change over time, yes. right? So we might say that, you know, it, uh, you know a, a cell phone might have been a luxury good 
uh, 15, 20 years ago, and it might be viewed as a necessity to get information about, about job opportunities and transportation uh, and access uh, information, right? So, so our uh, uh, understanding about what it means to, to live a life outside of poverty might, might change over time. Um, what the point I do like to make, though, is that even though we've made considerable progress towards poverty. We're not saying that we've solved this challenge, right? One, in one sense, there are always going to have a challenge because our standard, our expectations about, about what it means to, to live a life outside of poverty probably uh, increases as we have, as we grow as an economy. Um, but the other is that there are new challenges that arise that um, that clearly have not been addressed. You know, we could you could talk about the opioid crisis or uh, the low quality schooling, in, particularly in inner city communities. Uh, uh, you know, issues with with uh, gangs and violence, particularly challenges that 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 uh, young kids and teenagers face. These are all. Uh, vaccine persistent problems, uh, homelessness is one we might talk about later on, right? Um, is, you know, we, we've seen in certain communities that actually get worse. Um, and so those are important issues that still need to be addressed. But that doesn't mean we haven't made progress, right? right. Um, a, a stat I like to like to mention is that if you look at the housing conditions of the bottom 20% in the United States, so take the poorest 20% of families in the United States today, and look at you know, the square footage of their living units, look at the amenities that they have in, in their, uh, their houses or apartments, look at the, the crime in their neighborhood, all, all of these characteristics, right? They look quite similar to those same measures uh, for the middle class in the 1980s. So the, the, the living conditions of the poor today uh, are, so the lowest 20% are comparable to those for the middle class in the 1980s. That's not to say, the those at the bottom 20 percent are doing just fine that's just to say that we've gotten better and things weren't that great back in 1980 right there were, there were lots of lots of challenges um a cu couple of follow-ups and then i want to go on to the work of leo and and kind of what you're doing within the community that is battling poverty and all the ways you were describing from education to safety homelessness and the like but a point you were getting at before in terms of how we measure poverty in this country you know you have the objective and subjective measures you make a very important distinction, I, I believe, in one of the recent interviews, you know, what poverty is and then inequality. And, mm -hmm. and you know, this notion that there are those who measure poverty, not just in terms of what you're talking about, you know, uh, their income, including transfer payments or uh, their housing in terms of amenities, but they're looking at relative to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Talk right. about that in terms of that, how that impacts policy conversations around poverty uh, and how some, you know, are looking at, okay, let's just enhance the living of those who are making, you know, at that bottom quintile, that, you know, 20% and lower uh, versus trying to say, okay, no, the, the, the bottom quintile needs to look closer, more like the lifestyle of those at the top quintile. Yeah, so uh, an important distinction to make uh, between poverty and inequality, right? We could have uh, poverty falling, right? Because the economic circumstances at the bottom are improving, but inequality rising if the economic circumstances at the very top of the distribution are rising even faster. And, you know, we could have... There are, there are people who debate over whether or not that's that's a good thing. You know, if we're improving the... If the rising tide's lifting all boats, but but it's lifting the boats to the top more, uh, is, that, is that okay? Um, but, uh, you know, what we do see is that, is that the economic circumstances, circumstances at the bottom are rising. And that's in, that's in an absolute terms, right? So it's not necessarily relative to, to what's happening uh, at the top of the distribution. And the purpose of a social safety net in large part is to provide a consumption floor, right, for uh, when when times are bad, and um, and in that sense, you want to see that that uh, uh, people aren't frequently falling into poverty, and that pov we we are uh, reducing uh, the fraction of families that are living below a certain level um, over time. Um, inequality. Um, is a different set of, it could be a different set of policies. Now you could fight inequality by 
by have, expanding the social safety net and lifting up the bottom, right? Um, but we also address inequality um, through redistribution at other points in, in the income distribution. Sure, and progressive taxation and, sure. and, and the like would be an example. And this is where Senator Graham has done some work. There's one, one other piece is it's not just about measuring whether we're doing a better job taking care of the poor, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 making sure that there is more income for the poor, either because better job opportunities, paying more, or the transfer payments and government support, but also to what extent is the, are the, is the poor able to exit that mm -hmm. quintile, right? The lower 20% quintile, which you and I have been discussing. And, and Senator Graham makes the argument that you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, migration out of the lower quintile to other quintiles, right? Um, and and in both directions, right? So the opportunity, mm -hmm. which of course, keyword in, in Leo's name, um, seems to be there for people to exit poverty. Maybe talk about that. We're with uh, Dr. Jim Sullivan, who is professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame and director of the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities. Why don't you talk to us, Jim, about the importance of our policies and our programs that allow people to exit that lower quintile and and, and exit uh, being within the uh, the poverty line. Yeah, I think you know we might start with one of the the biggest barriers to exit um, is that uh, there are many children, families, adults that uh, don't have access to the same opportunities, and uh, and so. Uh, some interesting policies on that front would be policies to provide opportunities so that these individuals, uh, adults and children, uh, can exit. Um, and and one of the areas where we're seeing some some growing evidence of return on investment and impact um, for children is is early childhood in, in development investments, right? So that um, we know that. Um, that many of the disparities we see in economic outcomes at age 25 can be accounted for by the disparities that happen at age five. And so that suggests that we, uh, we need to uh, provide greater opportunities at age five to address the disparities that might, might uh, uh, emerge later on. And so that, so that points to, uh, you know, it, it typically means more than just uh, adequate childcare, right? Because because oftentimes the evidence suggests that that at um, early childhood, at early in the child development, we're not getting the kind of supports that foster growth in both cognitive and non-cognitive skills that will, will will allow them to succeed in school and then subsequently in the labor market. Um, and so investments in those programs uh, uh, produce some promise of, of creating more opportunities for them to exit out of out of poverty. All right. So we were talking about how you exit out of out of poverty. Uh... Uh, Jim Sullivan, a director of, uh, of, of co-founder of, of Leo, focusing on uh, early childhood education um, uh, being a key to get there. Be before we exit the beginning of the conversation, I, I must mention I was preparing uh, for our conversation and saw over the weekend uh, the Washington Post Book World, and it featured from you know front page of of their section. Uh, called Rich Country, Poor Country, and it was profiled two books, one by a Washington University scholar, another Princeton scholar, really going to the heart of our discussion. And, and, and in this article uh, written by Timothy Noah, uh, writes for the New Republic, emphasized the o OECD standard, Jim, uh, mm -hmm. and said that of the 37 OECD country, uh, the United States finishes 10th with a 15% Poverty rate. I just wanted to kind of close the loop on this to to get your sense of how the OECD uh, measures this and whether you think it's uh, an accurate kind of reflection of how the United States uh, is doing in the fight against poverty and 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 really an actual accurate reflection of the level of poverty in the United States. Yeah. So when we when we talk about the United States being tenth, uh, that's a point in time, right? So that's let's compare the poverty rate today in the United States to the poverty rate uh, in European countries, for example. And uh, it's true that there are um, more generous social safety nets in, in many of the European countries, which would elevate the resources of those at the bottom of the distribution, which would lead to, to, to lower poverty rates. Um, 
but the the I think the key part that that uh, that story emphasizes that's missed uh, compared to our discussion um, is in, in, in the discussion of those books, there's talk about us not making progress over time in terms of the fight of poverty. And those are, are good examples of the story, just th of people getting the story wrong, right? So they, they, those books talk about how uh, we, you know, they, they refer to making no progress towards improving economic circumstances of disadvantaged families in the United States. And that's just simply not true when you look at the data. Over time, if you look at the official poverty measure, you might one might conclude that, um, or you could take you could look at a point in time and say and identify a group that's really struggling and say we still we're not making progress. But that's not evidence of not making progress, right? That's just evidence that there are still people in need. Let's follow up on the last point you made in terms of how we exit out of poverty, because that should be the goal, right? We, mm -hmm. you know, the, so much of the political divide in this country on this suite of issues is whether or not we are spending enough to deal with poverty. And, and conservatives often will say, listen, we're spending so much uh, of our mandatory spending, you know, on an annual basis, uh, whether it's healthcare, whether it's, you know, the food program, SNAP, whether it's housing. Uh, and, you know, our conversation today has certainly done, done a lot, right, to elevate the lives of those who find themselves in poverty. But conservatives say, okay, but... What are we doing about helping people exit, right? So we're not sustaining poverty, where we're rewarding work is what conservatives often will point to, where we're creating opportunities. And, and to extend conservatives are willing to you know, talk about equality, they want equality of opportunity, right? Uh, talk to us about the work at LEO where you, through the data, see opportunities to help those who are in poverty, right, impoverished, yep an opportunity to exit. You were just talking about education. What policy solutions, for example, given that, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're sharing in terms of Leo's view that, Hey, if we intervene, if there's intervention, education, quality education, age five, there's a better chance that by 25, they're going to enhance their opportunities and, and, and exit poverty. What would be some of the policy solutions that, uh, that you've seen might work, uh, or you would, uh, advance given that, uh, insight you just shared? Yeah, so if people ask me, you know, if, if I had a fixed budget and I could only invest in one thing, uh, I usually turn to early childhood because it pays off this, this long run investment, but that is not very satisfying for the millions of people that live in poverty today. Um, and so then that, that speaks to your really difficult question, which is what do we do about helping those that are, that are in poverty today escape poverty? Um, and uh, you know, the work at LEO has uh, exposed us to uh, a number of, or well, many wonderful initiatives in communities all across the country that are being implemented by nonprofit service providers to address just this question, right? So uh, one of the things uh, that we like to mention with our, that we've learned from our partnerships with these nonprofits is they're the ones that are on the front lines fighting poverty every day. They're the ones that understand the needs of the community and what and what uh, is going to uh, address those needs and what's not going to. Uh, and so we turn to them and say, well, what 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 kind of intervention uh, do you desire? Would you design to address the needs of, of of your community? And then we partner with them to measure that impact. And uh, and there's a number of different approaches that um, that that have been uh, successful. One that I that I will mention is. Um, that so a group that that has some of the most disadvantaged uh, outcomes in this country are uh, those that never finish high school. If you don't finish high school, uh, you earn your earnings are seventy percent lower than just a high school graduate, right? And your children are twice as likely to be a high school dropout uh, than high, the children of, of of high school grads. So you get this intergenerational transformation uh, transition of a uh, of, of poverty. Yes, it's a vicious cycle and. And so what do we do about, uh, if you're 25 and you don't have a high school degree, w one thing that you could do is get a GED. Now there's, there's a lot of research out there showing that a GED does not produce the return on investment uh, that a high school degree does. It, the, the earnings are much higher for high school, those with a high school degree than those with a GED. In fact, the earnings of those with a GED is pretty close to those uh, that just drop out of high school and don't have a GED. Uh, so what do we do? Well, there's an intervention that was designed by um, by Goodwill that, that these Goodwill Excel centers that are essentially 
um, an accredited program that allows adults who have aged out of high school to obtain their high school degree and get post-secondary credentials. And, they, uh, and the interesting feature of this is that many states won't allow, won't grant a high school degree to adults who are above a certain age. So once you reach 21, you can't, you, you can no longer get, get a high school degree. Some states allow this and the Excel centers operate in those states. And they recognize that, that adults in these circumstances need more than a traditional high school, right? So they need, they need childcare. They, they oftentimes need uh, counseling, coaching, mentoring, because they're dealing with uh, you know, a prison record or they're dealing with substance abuse and other issues in their lives. Um, and what we show in our partnership with them is that the earnings of those that, that complete the Excel Center program and get a high school degree through that program um, are 40% higher than those uh, than than a comparable group that doesn't doesn't complete the program. They have better jobs, more likely to to go on in school. And so it's an example of an intervention that could actually lift a very disadvantaged group out of poverty, give them an opportunity to to exit poverty. And we have evidence to show the impact. So you have the data that shows the GED is not going to solve the problem. It's not going to have a material impact on income as if they were just a, a high school dropout without a high school diploma. It requires this combination of certification, which includes some mm -hmm. coaching, counseling to deal with the other challenges that may be facing personal or external in terms of family challenges. You bring that package together, and now you're seeing the effects that we all wanted at the outset, which was actually giving them an opportunity to exit uh, their current station. That's right. The education side. Yeah, and, and um, the, I'll make a point about the data, and maybe we'll, we will talk more about it later, but... Um, you know, the provider has data on the students they serve. So the Excel centers have data on the students they serve while they're serving them. Right? They don't have good information on what happens to those students afterwards. They don't have good information on what happened to those students beforehand. So they can't do great measure of, of how much their earnings increase. And more importantly, they rarely ever have information on the students, the potential students that they never serve, right? That we compare the graduates to. But we get access to the data uh, for all of those groups, right? So we get that we get access for both those that go through the program and don't before they enter the program and then follow them afterwards. And that really allows us to measure impact in the way that the nonprofit community could never, never do. We're speaking with Dr. Jim Sullivan, who is professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame and co-founder and director of the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, LEO Education. We were just speaking about the data that helps nonprofits understand exactly the impact they could make. Um, are they tailoring their programs on the basis of Leo putting out reports? All right, so that you know, we're thinking in this community, in this locality, we want to help uh, those without a high school diploma, uh, don't have their GED. How do we kind of use the resources we're able to cobble together, be it a nonprofit or government? And then Leo says, okay, you want to kind of have a program that has these elements because you're going to get the best result. Is that how, how it's supposed to work in terms of Leo's interaction across the country? Yeah, I mean, we engage in these projects because we believe that if we could show evidence that a particular program works, that it has the possibility, potential to scale and have much greater impact. And in fact, that's that's the driving motivation for doing this in the first place. So we, you know, it, we, we do see that it directly benefits our partners that we're working with. But more importantly, if you want to have broad impact, you, you, you need to uh, have others acting on this evidence. So going back to the Excel Center uh, example, uh, we shared this evidence with uh, the, the state of Arizona legislature, and then they changed the state law so that uh, Excel centers could operate there. And then in the state of Indiana, where, where um, there already are several Excel centers operating, uh, the governor just earlier this year announced a new initiative investing $50 million so that Excel centers could expand throughout the state. And so it's a good example of, of based on our evidence, policymakers are responding to to uh, further the impact that this program is having, which I know is you know that that's the key and 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 issues that end up becoming ideological and 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 fissures along partisan lines. Now you can cut through all of that because you know you you could connect the dots between you know the policy and policy outcomes, irrespective of you know the the, the partisan association. Jim, give us a discussion, we, we, uh, 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 perhaps an example on the education side, where 
they were lacking in the evidence, the sort of thing that Leo would be able mm -hmm. to offer. Uh, and they kept on throwing good money after a program that, you know, was not yielding results. Perhaps it was a program that was emphasizing GEDs without the other uh, type of support they need or, or something else. You know, you're coming in, you're presenting to somebody who we are at Leo and, and why the evidence is so critical into, into determining good public policy and allocation of, 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 you know, public funds or even nonprofit funds. What do you turn to, to say, Hey, this, this is the difference between using the data versus not. So uh, I, an example of a program, and we like to talk about ex of programs that work, but, but, but the, it's a really good point you make that we also learn a lot about programs that don't work. And either way, we, let's let the evidence tell us how we should allocate those resources. Um, uh, in the community college space, uh, there is great concern about the fact that the majority of students that enroll in community college never finish. And there are all sorts of proposals about and policy initiatives to try to increase persistence and degree completion at community colleges across the country. And one uh, proposal that, that uh, got traction and started to expand across the country is the idea of providing emergency financial assistance for community college students. So uh, if they're struggling to pay rent, we can help them pay rent. If their car breaks down, we can, we can uh, pay for, for the vehicle repair so they can still come to class, right? Uh, so the program was designed to help these students when, when uh, they were struggling to, to make ends meet and still, still in, uh, stay enrolled in college. Um, and in a randomized controlled trial study that we ran in partnership with uh, a large community college, we, where one group got uh, emergency financial assistance, but the other group uh, did not, we what we found was that there were there were no differences between the the rates that they stayed enrolled uh, and the degree to, to the fraction that that completed a degree, um, and the and actually we had another component of the intervention where they got emergency financial assistance and coaching and mentoring. And what we showed is that when you get those together, you actually do see sizable effects, particularly for female uh, community college students on both persistence and degree completion. And, and a, a really interesting uh, result of that is that there are a number of foundations across the country that were starting to invest in this emergency financial assistance. And, and when we released our results, um, they called us and they said, hey, we want to hear about this. We want to know what the evidence is. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we're never excited about showing the, somebody that the showing evidence that a program doesn't work, but we do think it's critically important, right? Because we want to be, you know, we want to help those that are the most disadvantaged and there is a scarcity of resources. And so the, the way to do that most effectively is to allocate resources towards the programs that work. Sure. And in this case, when you're talking about it, it would seem to be just kind of adding on a couple of pieces to a program, you know, yes, they, they may need the, those emergency funds, but that's not sufficient, right? And, and right. not having the intended effect. Let's go to a couple other uh, areas that Leo's focused on. Uh, one I want to talk about is homelessness. You mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, clearly uh, a problem, certainly in the mind of Americans during the pandemic, we saw uh, what appeared to be a spike in homelessness. Certainly it was more apparent in our cities. Um, Talk to us about Chicago Homelessness Prevention, Prevention Call Center uh, in terms of Leo's work and perhaps uh, what it teaches and, and, and we can learn about homelessness uh, in the United States. Yeah, so maybe just as background, I'll, I'll say that, you know, we have about uh, more than a than half a million uh, individuals at any given point in time that are living in homelessness in the United States. And if you look at uh, how many enter homelessness over the course of the year, it's more than two million. Uh, and so we have a, a, you know, clearly a challenge that that is uh, particularly acute in in urban areas. And um, and there's a number of different policies that that have been proposed and scaled to address that. And it turns out that one of the uh, common approaches, so by common I mean 95% uh, of all major cities across the country have um, uh, a network of emergency financial assistance provision that helps those that are about to get evicted from their apartments uh, uh, pay the one month's rent. And so this is uh, a homelessness prevention program, not, not a, a, a program to address those that are already homeless. And uh, we were struck by the, when we, when we first encountered this, that 
uh, by the scale of these programs, that they were already being implemented uh, all across the country. And we asked a simple question of what is the evidence that helping those that are about to get evicted pay one month's rent actually prevents them from becoming homeless? And the answer was there is none. It just delays and, it for a month. And, and well, the, that, that's a great a question is, does it delay it for a month? Mm -hmm. And um, and what we did, uh, so we partnered with the Homelessness Prevention Call Center in Chicago. And they are um, the entity, all, so all provision of emergency financial assistance to help those that are about to get evicted in the city of Chicago is centralized to run through the Homelessness Prevention Call Center. If you call 311, you're about to get evicted from your apartment, you call 311 in Chicago, you get routed to the Homelessness Prevention Call Center. They screen you for eligibility. And then uh, if you're eligible, they look to see whether or not there's funding available. And uh, and then if there's funding available, they refer you for uh, to get the assistance. And the, a, a feature of that process is that sometimes you call and there's no funding available, and other times you call and there is funding available. And so what we did is we we took the data on everybody who called the call center. They get about 75,000 calls a year. Um, we took data on everybody who called the call center. We restricted it to those that were eligible. And we compared the homelessness rates for those who happened to call when funding was available to those that happened to call when it was not, right? So by the luck of the draw, uh, some got funding and some didn't. And we tracked their shelter entry, homeless shelter entry rates over time for these two groups. And what we found was that those that happened to call on a day when funding was available, so they, so they were much more likely to get the assistance, were 76% less likely to be homeless six months later than those that called when uh, funding was not available. So it's, it's clear evidence that this kind of, of uh, assistance actually is effective at, re at reducing homelessness. And then we kind of, we, we, we went on to get at the question that you wondered, which is, are you just kicking the can down the road? You know, if we look eight months down the road, are they then gonna be, become homeless? And it turns out that uh, we, we were following data for more than a year, and we still see this noticeable difference between those that, that had access to the funding for, versus those that did not. Now, an interesting feature of that intervention is that it's targeting, it's not uh, an unconditional cash transfer. It's targeting the, tra the transfers to those that have faced an, uh, an economic shock, right? So they lost their job, they got cut off from benefits, and they're about to get evicted. And we know that getting evicted leads to all sorts of other challenges. And in order to be eligible, you had to have access, document income that you'd be able to pay rent in the future. Right, so it really is trying to identify a short-term shock. Um, and in essence, what the call center is doing is providing insurance against a short-term shock. And what our evidence shows is that it actually uh, does reduce the likelihood that they become homeless. Fascinating. Um, let, let's take a zoom out for a second. Uh, and then I wanna talk about some of your other work uh, kind of adjacent to Leo before we mm -hmm. uh, move towards the end of our conversation. And that is, big entitlement programs, the ones that the federal government, uh, as mentioned before, you know, covers about 70% of our overall spending. If you combine the mandatory spending and, and discretionary spending that make up, uh, the U S government's federal spending on an annual basis. And you have Medicaid, the healthcare, you have, uh, SNAP program, um, it's also security built into that, mm -hmm. uh, which is not tied directly to what we're, we're talking about. Has Leo taken a look at some of the evidence of whether or not these big federal entitlement programs, which often you have the partisan division, either we just need to continue to fund it and fund it more uh, versus those who say, listen, we need to stop throwing money at this problem and get control of the entitlements. You know, is there is there some evidence based work that you've done that perhaps offers, uh, you know, an out from what seems to be uh, this very stale and uh, kind of frozen debate, uh, which is not allowed for any uh, political agreement between, you know, our, how we handle entitlement spendings, whether we got to add more, or we got to, we got to reform it, and, and it just leaves us doing nothing. 
Yeah, so Leo's focus really is on addressing the effectiveness of programs on the front lines, uh, which uh, in particular those that are implemented by uh, nonprofit organizations. And uh, now nonprofit organizations oftentimes uh, are implementing programs that are funded by the county, the state, uh, or, or even the, the, the federal government. Um, but, but you know, our, our research portfolio really focuses on, on those programs rather than evaluating large-scale federal programs. Our, we, we kind of want to take this as a different approach and say, let's build the evidence on what works at the local level and then scale it up to the federal level when we know it works. Right. And, and kind of large federal policy is let's let's uh, launch a large program at the federal level. Right. And spend billion, you know, tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars on it and then see see if it works. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't we're not going to address poverty uh, only by uh, building evidence from from the ground up because 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 that's a, a, a long process. But we think it's it's critically important and we would like to for what we're doing at the local level really to be a model for what happens at the federal level. And so we've been in conversations uh, at the federal level of how do we access data so that we can do just that and so that we can answer the questions that you pose with, you know, it is what is the effect of the federal social safety net on key outcomes like uh, poverty, employment, economic well-being, et cetera. Got it. So uh, let's move outside of the work in Leo and kind of get to this a little bit more. Um, you assisted with the U.S. Commission for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act in 2018. Uh, you were recently appointed to the U.S. Commission on Social Impact Partnership. Uh, and then you also serve on the National Pover Poverty Research Center Advisory Board. Well, what are you seeing happening at, at this level outside of, you know, the work in Leo? Uh, and particularly your work on the commission. Tell us about some of the work you're, you're doing there and how this evidence-based approach that's been successful and, and impactful uh, for nonprofits at this local and state level potentially could have uh, a broader impact uh, nationally. Yeah, so my interest in uh, kind of making it easier to build evidence at the national level really comes from our work at LEO. And so um, I happened to have a conversation with uh, then um, Chair of the Ways and Means, uh, uh, Representative Paul Ryan, and uh, this was back in 20, 2015. And uh, uh, he asked me, you know, what are the biggest challenges you face trying to build evidence uh, in your work with nonprofits? And I said, it's access to data. It's that we can't get access to the data that's out there that would allow us to create much greater evidence on a large scale on what in terms of what works and what doesn't and uh and, and what came out of the conversation a couple of things one is is he recognized that that's exactly the challenge that they're facing at the federal level um also that building evidence was fundamentally a bipartisan issue that 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 they might they might use the evidence and, and, and interpret it different ways but everybody kind of agrees that we want to have better evidence in terms of what works and what doesn't and uh and so uh he partnered with uh senator patty ryan uh you know on the democrat side to first launch um the the commission for evidence-based policy making in, in 2016 and um and what came out of that commission was a long report that you can read with all sorts of uh, fun details about what we should be doing to create greater access to data so that we can understand the effectiveness of government programs. And uh, and I mean, it's a, it's an excellent report. It has 22 recommendations. And what, what followed shortly thereafter was uh, the Evidence Act that was passed at the end of 2018, where they passed uh, about half of those 22, 22 proposed initiatives. They kind of took the uh, a little bit of the low hanging fruit. Where we're, we now have, uh, you know, like chief evidence officers in government agencies who can really start to to guide the agencies in terms of of their strategy for for making uh, data available and and uh, uh, monitoring evidence. Um, there is still some 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 key. Uh, legislative changes that, that that need to be made. Uh, the, uh, the probably the the most ambitious proposal that came out of the commission was to create uh, a secure 
national data service, which would be which would allow researchers to connect with government data to uh, in a very secure way so that we're not not uh, infringing on individual privacy to in order to understand the impact of programs implemented at the federal, state and and local level. Um, and I think it's helpful to have a have an example of how, of how this works. And I'll go back to the uh, Excel Center example I talked about earlier. Um, to measure the impact of a of a social policy program on employment, right? What we need to know is whether or not individuals are employed, right? That ends up being a key outcome for many programs that we evaluate. We have data on employment, and we have the history of uh, of individuals' employments over long periods of time. Uh, available in government records because of the unemployment insurance system. So everybody who has a job in the formal sector, essentially, is uh, is in these data. So I can observe uh, at any given quarter whether or not you're working and what your earnings are, right? All in a in a private way. I don't observe who the person is, but I, but I know that observation. Um, and that allows me to track individuals' earnings over time so that those that, uh, say, are eligible for a particular program, uh, I know what their earnings look like and I can compare it to those that, that maybe are, are just ineligible or, or don't get access to the program and allows us to understand the impacts of the, of the program. And, and those data are out there, right? But it's very difficult to get access to it, uh, even though we, we, we have had some success. Um, and part of the effort is let's Let's create greater access to these data so that we can understand how to allocate scarce resources. We're here with Dr. Jim Sullivan, who is the professor of economics, University of Notre Dame, and the co-founder director of LEO, the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities. We're going to move to our, our lightning round in just a minute and conclude our conversation. But before we do, uh, just give us a, a qu quick uh, commercial here. How do people learn more about the work at Leo? Uh, where, where should they be looking to find out the latest uh, insights and uh, uh, data-driven policy from Leo? Uh, yeah, so I would encourage anybody who's interested in Leo uh, to go to our website at leo.nd.edu. You can also follow us at uh, at Leo at ND uh, on uh, all the social media channels. And uh, yeah, we if, if uh, you can. There's a way to contact us through through uh, our website, and we'd be delighted to talk to to those that are interested in hearing more about our evidence or partnering with us to generate evidence. Fantastic. Let's go to lightning round. Here is where you share your favorite Reagan quote, speech, uh, or book on President Reagan. Certainly, uh, creating opportunity for all Americans was uh, top priority and and a key element of President Reagan's time in office and, and legacy. So there's certainly alignment there. Jim, what do you have for us? Well, my, my favorite quote is not said by Ronald Reagan. It was said, uh, I guess, about him uh, when he played the role of the Gipper. It was win one for the Gipper. And, <laughs> and uh, as, a, as a member of Notre Dame's faculty, it's hard for me to pass up on, on that one. That uh, coming, if, huh? if you really want one that, that, that he actually said, um, and it's probably, you know, I actually quote Ronald Reagan on this uh, a fair amount, uh, is from his 1988 State of the Union address, when, like, you know, he said it like nobody else can. He, he, he said, uh, my friends, some, some years ago, we declared a war on poverty, and poverty won. And he said that uh, based on the official poverty measure, right? And, 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 and based on the official poverty measure, he was right. But we use that as a motivation for how important it is to, to uh, think about the flaws in that measure and uh, how that story actually changes uh, if you address those flaws. Jim Sullivan, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, it's great to talk to you, Roger. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.